Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, <laughs> and welcome to tonight's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Nick Offerman. I'm an actor, author, and woodworker, and I'm very excited to be here with you moderating tonight's program. It is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Michael Schur, author of How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question. Michael is the brain and heart behind many of TV's most popular shows, including uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, in which I played Ron Swanson pretty much the whole time, and others. Uh, oh, they want me to say uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and The Good Place. Um, building off the philosophy behind The Good Place, Michael's book, How to Be Perfect, aims to tackle the complex moral questions we face every day, like how much money should I give to charity, or why bother being good at all when there are no consequences for being bad. While it may not have all the answers necessary to eradicate our imperfections, Mike's book aims to leave us with knowledge that could allow us to become even better people in the long run. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask Mike some of your questions. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll get to them later in the program. Mike, welcome. Let me start off by allowing you to respond to my welcome. <laughs> I will respond by saying it is a delight as always, to see you and to hear your dulcet tones. And thank you for doing this. It's very kind of you. It's my pleasure. And uh, I have to say, I, sincerely, you, you're uh, gaining more gray hair as the years go by, and it uh, is very becoming. Thank you. Yeah, that is what tends to happen with gray hair. Uh, I've learned is that it increases in frequency and volume as you get older. But um, since I wrote a book on philosophy, I've decided to embrace it and try to lean into the aging, wizened academic type and hope that that will take me places. So you're in favor is what you're saying. You like the, you like the, you like, you like the new. It's gray. working. Yeah. All right. You're, great. you're well on your way. <laughs> wizened, wizened AF, as the kids would say. That is what they would say. Yes. Uh, Mike, I love your book. Um, I, it is such a great encapsulation of um, it, it in a book that I wrote some years ago. Uh, one of my dedications was to you, and it, it said uh, for for showing me how funny we can be while still saying I love you. And that your your whole sort of ethos, you know, you're you're this incredibly smart, talented comedy writer who creates uh, and writes shows and produces shows. Um, but the whole time you have this, you know, this sort of niggling sense of like pursuing uh, a sense of ethos with your work that I think is astonishing because for me and most other people who, who want to make people laugh, moral philosophy is not what springs to mind is, is sort of the foundation. Um, how did how did that happen? How did you become such a great comedy writer and creator who also is is like a benevolent philosopher? <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> um, comedy writing is my uh, profession, I guess, and and the thing that I've always loved doing um, since I was a kid and discovered, you know, Monty Python and Saturday Night Live and David Letterman, like I, it's all I ever wanted to be really was a comedy writer. Over the course of my life, I I realized pretty early on that I was oriented in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the impolite way to describe that orientation would be kiss ass. And the polite way would be to say a dutiful child who who uh, believes in rules and, and order. And like when I was in kindergarten, I have a very specific memory of a teacher saying, okay, everybody line up. 
and immediately getting into line and then looking around at the other kids who hadn't gotten in line and thinking very clearly, I remember this, thinking, what are you doing? Like, what, this is insane. She just said, get in line. Like, how have you not already obeyed that uh, direction? So I, I, I think that somewhere, and this is a little bit of an Aristotelian idea, I think I had this kind of starter kit um, from birth that was aimed at kind of understanding rules, understanding right and wrong and trying to do right. Um, and then as a adult that has blossomed into this sense of at, at various moments in my life, I have horribly fouled something up, uh, caused someone some kind of embarrassment or anger or pain or anguish or something. And in those moments, my instinct is always to go, uh, I know what that I know what I did was wrong and I don't know why. And eventually that led me to an interest in moral philosophy, because at the very least, I thought, if I know why what I did, what was was wrong or bad, <clears throat> I can I can avoid doing that in the future. So it is it's this the philosophy interest is this kind of natural outcropping from, again, what some people might call being a kiss ass and other people might say a general interest in right and wrong and rules and such. So you put those two things together and I end up being a professional comedy writer who reads a lot of um, weird philosophy books. Well, it stands to reason. And to remind me, w wasn't there some seminal uh, paper, <clears throat> either a high school term paper or a college thesis that was about Wendell Berry that you wrote? It was in high school, yes. Um, this is what uh, one of the many things that you and I, over the course of our lives, have found we accidentally share coming from two extremely different angles into the world you yeah. as a, a essentially a farmer in central illinois and me as a bored suburban uh dude in in northeastern new england um have found over the years that we have these very very specific things in common and one of them is wendell berry my friend jamie hordekin when i was in college was uh a great outdoorsman and he turned me on to the writings of Wendell Berry and I ended up writing a paper when I was a senior in high school about the writings of Wendell Berry and um and just his sort of outlook on life and then whatever I was 17 and so call it 24 years later you and I one day were out at dinner I think and you mentioned that you were writing about Wendell Berry and I said that's interesting I wrote about Wendell Berry once <laughs> so yeah there there is a sort of eclecticism, if that's a word, to the things that I've been interested in, in my life. Um, I am not an outdoorsy person. Uh, I am. There's an episode of Parks and Rec where everybody goes camping, and Ben Wyatt refuses to engage in the concept of camping. And at one point, so I think you point out, someone points out that he didn't bring a sleeping bag, and he's and he says, "I'll just sleep on the floor." And your response is, "It's called the ground when it's outside." <laughs> that I'm, I'm Ben Wyatt in that, <laughs> that scenario. So I, it's not that I adopted a lot of this stuff wholesale, but I have liked in my life to po poke around and find different writers whose writings I just find interesting or attractive or, or moving in some way and try to sort of like eat them and assimilate them into my life. Well, that, that makes sense. And I, uh, I, I, I do want to say, um, for the sake of my my family who the side of my family who are farmers i i'm always quick to point out that uh i grew up working on my family's farm but uh i i've never been a full-on farmer I'm, I'm the child of a of a farming family but um i i, I feel like i'm i would it, it's a false claim to be it would be you'd be an imposter if you claim yeah. to be a farmer yeah i hear I that would, i would aspire to my my uncles and cousins and aunts uh, are all heroic farmers and i look up to them for it um i uh there's there's so many questions i have going through your book i guess uh before i get into some some that i noted down there's i, I was pretty fascinated with the uh there's sort of two things in the book that you cite um as being uh, having to do with the the sort of inception of this fascination of yours uh mm -hmm. one that's more tangible i had never heard this story and it's pretty great um would you would you tell the 
the anecdote about uh, JJ's fender bender? Sure. I'll try to condense it for the sake of time. But um, sure. <clears throat> my wife in 2005, in a very slow moving uh, tap, tap on a guy's uh, bumper in front of him going about one mile an hour. Policeman looks everything over, doesn't see any damage. They exchange numbers anyway. They go about their day. We get a claim from this gentleman saying that his entire bumper needed to be replaced and the cost was $836. Now pause and uh, learn that this was literally during the devastation of New Orleans by Hurricane Katrina, which for some reason, I don't know why, but it hit, that event hit me really hard. JJ and I had just been to New Orleans very recently and had sort of fallen in love with the city. I had a friend who lived there who had been forced to evacuate. And um, and I just, for some reason, more than the average enormous disaster, that it was really hitting me kind of hard. So I went and looked at the guy's car and I saw this incredibly faint crease, uh, the kind of thing that you could, you could look at it from a distance of four feet and not notice anything wrong. And if you got to 18 inches, you would say, oh yeah, I see there's a little crease there. So I told the guy in a fit of peak, and righteousness that I didn't think that this was worth $836 and I, that he shouldn't care about his car this much. And, um, and I said, how about this? I'll send that money to the uh, Red Cross to sit to, for the hurricane Katrina relief fund. Uh, and we'll call it even, how about that? And he said, well, I don't know. I'll think it over. So then I went, I was working at the office at the time, the show, the office, and I, told the people there what had happened. And suddenly they started pitching in and committing more and more money if this guy wouldn't fix his bumper. <laughs> it's a very weird situation. So soon it's like, well, now we have $2,000 pledged and now we have $4,000 pledged. And I made a blog and I told the story and people started writing in and saying, I'll chip in 25 bucks and I'll pay five bucks and this and that. So suddenly... Um, we had a commitment within like 24 hours of something like $25,000. Like, and, and it just took off. It was the first thing that I was aware of that really kind of in quotes went viral. This guy knows nothing of this, by the way. He is completely unaware of this. So JJ and I, I and then I start getting media requests because it gets to various people. And I got NPR and, and the New Yorker and Good Morning America. They want to interview me to, to talk about this. So JJ and I on the second night are kind of going over everything and we're excitedly talking and now we have $28,650 pledged and we immediately both at the same exact moment got sick to our stomachs and she said this is bad and I said you're right and I don't know why like I I know this is wrong and if I had studied philosophy in college I would know why this is wrong and I panicked. I really did. I, I had a real sense of like, oh no, I'm in way too deep. And I started reading moral philosophy. I started looking up like, what is ethics? What, what is right and wrong? What is good and bad? I sent a bunch of emails to a bunch of ethics professors, moral philosophy professors. And I, I read a bunch of stuff and I came to the not shocking conclusion. Most of the people, when I tell the story are way ahead of me. And the conclusion was like, Look, we were negotiating this guy and me over a very minor incident, and it's entirely unfair of me to drag in this entirely asymmetric disaster to make him feel bad about what he's doing. Like he didn't set the price of a new bumper for a car. He didn't. He did, was minding his own business, and someone bumped into him. And suddenly, I'm saying you shouldn't care about this because Hurricane Katrina is happening. And if you think about it that way. It doesn't make any sense. And so I eventually called the guy. I copped to the whole thing. I laid out the whole story. I apologize. I sent him a check. He said maybe he would give some of it to the Red Cross. I said, that's great. You are in no way morally obligated to do that. And it was really, that was really in some way the, the beginning of this whole journey for me was feeling very strongly like, man, if I had read all this stuff, and I had talked to all these people, and I had even a rudimentary understanding of philosophy, before my wife accidentally tapped that guy's bumper, I could have avoided so much pain and suffering and embarrassment, frankly, and shame and guilt and everything else. So that was like the that was like a, a, a the pilot light went on for me at that moment. And over the next 17 years, it has 
it's led to a, a steadier flame of wanting to learn about this stuff and understand what I'm doing so that I don't cause anyone that kind of pain again. Well, I, I'm grateful that happened. And would, would you be willing to uh, give us the man's name and address? Um, because no, no, no uh, I wouldn't. I'm actually, I don't even know. I don't remember. Like I, I started this blog. Test. You made the which, right decision. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, and I made very few good decisions during that whole period of time. And one of them is I never doxed the guy before anybody knew what doxing was. Like I never put his his license plate on the internet and I never mentioned what his name was or where he lived or anything. And uh, I mean, thank God, like it would have been so, so, so much worse um, if that had any of that stuff had uh, had led me to, you know, that that kind of event that would have been truly, truly awful. Well, I mean, uh, I, I love that that happened and I love I love what came out of it. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, um, I worked, I did that s series with Colin Kaepernick last year where I played his dad and learning his story, like l learning about people like when he was in high school and the Cubs offered him a million dollar signing bonus to come pitch for the Cubs, mm -hmm. my beloved Cubs. And, and he, his gut just said, said, no, I want to be a quarterback. And I just said, I said, and, and the same with, with, the light bulb that went off for you and JJ. I love, I love that, that notion that it can occur to humans when the vast majority of the rest of us, you know, if, if we're not conscientious in the right moment, it'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll surf on by on, on the wave of like popular opinion where it's like, Oh, this is amazing raising a bunch of money like it it has all the earmarks or superficiality of mm -hmm. being a good thing right but i love that both of you were like eh, hang on this is well there were a bunch of things in my sort of um debrief of it there were a bunch of interesting moments that i think were meaningful not just the ones that led me to read a bunch of philosophy but one of the most important moments was at some point he said to me you know, look, I have kids and they've ruined everything in my life. Like they've like everything in my whole house is a disaster. And the one thing that I have that isn't ruined, that is just mine and that I have the way I want it is my car. Wow. And I didn't have kids at the time. I do now. He was totally right. Like I <laughs> totally get it. But even at the time, I remember thinking like, well, hold on. This is a different perspective because I have this rant, this endlessly boring rant that will come out after my third whiskey about how people care about their cars too much in this city, specifically in LA, that car culture is kind of pointless, that cars are metal boxes that get you from one place to another. And we should only care about the most energy efficient car or the safest car and anything else is absurd. And I have had that rant since the moment I moved to LA, in fact, maybe before. Then I'm in this situation and this guy is upset about this minor damage done to his car and what comes out of me in that moment and it was rattling around my head, the dumb rant that I do all the time where I very self-assuredly proclaim that I have the right information and that I, my take on this is the correct take. And then a human being tells me about his human situation and puts things into a different context or perspective that I hadn't considered. And suddenly my hot take about car culture seems very short-sighted and very um, kind of cursory because all humans are not created equal. All people's lives are not equal. Everybody is living a different version of existence than everybody else. And his attitude about his car suddenly doesn't seem overly fastidious and kind of, you know, Niles Crane from frazier -y, but rather incredibly uh, understandable and explicable because kids ruin everything. <laughs> he had this nice car that he liked to keep. And so among other things, and this is, you know, stretching the boundaries of what you might consider philosophy, but among other things, it gave me a different philosophical understanding of just human nature to just get outside my own ego for a second, put myself in the shoes of a different person and imagine what his car represents to him instead of just digging in my heels and doubling down on my own kind of viewpoint about the world, 
that's a great lesson, man. I mean, that is a wonderful thing. I'm grateful that it happened too. I'm even though I, <clears throat> even though I, I caused him discomfort and I s- suffered from a significant amount of my own discomfort because of that. I think that we need to go through these things from time to time. And when we do, we come out the other side better for them. I, I agree. I just wish it wasn't a sob. Uh, <laughs> but that you, I mean, you've hit upon my solution and we may have spoken about this years ago, uh, to, uh, to surviving Los Angeles, uh, traffic. Mm-hmm. Are, are famously horrible traffic, um, it, which just gets worse and worse. It always seems like a video game where just getting to work and back, seven people try to kill you in seven <laughs> different ways. And I'm not exaggerating. You're, like you're dodging people mm-hmm. just careening across lanes of traffic with no rhyme or reason. And at, at some point it occurred to me, instead of being combative, uh, I... I don't remember what flipped the switch, but I thought, what if they're trying to get to an audition or what if the, you know, I, I, I just decided that it made me feel so much better if I was generous to them and was like, let's, let's say they're not an, let's say that, that, you know, they're going to the hospital, like they're, they're having a terrible day. And so I just started leaving a little earlier. Um, so that if people had to do that, it wouldn't freak me out. But I still get upset if I see a sob. Uh, <laughs> well, you're talking about yeah, you're you're being generous is a good way to put it, I think, right? Because you're you're basically like when someone cuts you off in traffic, that is the end of that interaction, right? You're not going to unless you're a lunatic. You're not going to speed up, weave through traffic by yourself cut the guy off, climb out of your car, go over, knock on his window and have a conversation with him. Like he has cut you off in traffic and sped away. And that is the last time that you will think about that person. And so your options are let it fester and curdle in your soul and think the worst about the human condition or throw out, play a game with yourself where you say like, yeah, maybe he's running late to pick up his kid from um from the hospital because his kid just broke his wrist and he just got that phone call that every parent dreads of like your son's been in an accident now is that the case probably not he's probably he's probably a guy who doesn't care about other people and has cut you off in traffic but given the fact that there is no future for you and that person at all anywhere it it does help sometimes to imagine a possible scenario in which that person actually had a reason to do what he did. And that doesn't mean that we should be pushovers and be ultimately and forever forgiving to the end of the earth for all bad behavior. Of course we shouldn't, but in situations under which you have no control, this is a stoic idea, right? The stoics were sort of like control what you can control and you can't control anything beyond what has happened. The only thing you can now control is your reaction to it and the way that you respond given that, given that thing that just happened to you. So control that to the best of your ability. That's a, that's a good kind of like a Greek philosophical lesson to try to follow. I think. But also the, uh, the way that you handled, um, you know, looking, looking at the sob situation uh, through another perspective, putting yourself in your neighbor's shoes mm-hmm. seems like a possible segue to Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Ubuntu. Is that, am I saying that right? Yeah. As far as I know, Ubuntu. Yes. That's uh that's how I've always heard it pronounced. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ubuntu is a, is a, it's a difficult to call it purely a philosophy. It's more of a sort of community wide ethos, or it's like a spirit that sort of pervades entire nations um, in Southern Africa. And it's difficult to describe it quickly. Um, it's mostly when people are asked to describe it, they mostly use certain phrases and aphorisms, one of which is um, a person is a person through other people. Um, and obviously these phrases and aphorisms often differ in translation depending on which African language they're being taken from. But a person is a person through other people. 
is is pretty close to describing it. Another one is I am because we are and and we are because I am. So it's essentially trying to take the concept of individualism or the ego and not eliminate it, but place it on exact equal footing with the concept of community health and happiness. So for example, Nelson Mandela in an interview that I write about in the book um, was asked about Ubuntu and the way he described it was if a, if a visitor comes to your village, everyone's instinct is the same, which is make sure he has water and food, make sure he has shelter, make sure he's okay, ask him if he needs anything and, and basically welcome him in and treat him as if you are treating the same way you would treat your closest friend or relative if your closest friend or relative came to visit you. And you do that when it's a complete stranger. So it's this kind of, it's this sense that, that you only uh, are, you can only be as good as an individual as the health and happiness of the community allows you to be. Um, so I, I talk about that in a book uh, in relation to this concept called contractualism, which is a philosophy invented by a guy named Tim Scanlon, um, Thomas Scanlon, he goes by Tim sometimes, it's confusing, who's a contemporary philosopher, still alive, still with us. And he had this idea of the way that you make rules in a society is you're all sitting around a table and everybody has a veto and you start pitching rules. And quite simply, the ones that get passed are the ones that nobody vetoes. And this is assuming, and this is kind of a big assumption, but it's assuming that everyone is what he calls reasonable, um, which is a loaded word that you can debate forever. But if everybody's being reasonable, you pitch a rule, hey, I, our rule is, the first rule is no one should murder anybody else. Anybody veto that? No, why would anyone veto that? That rule passes. And you just brick by brick build a society that is only the rules that everyone who is reasonable agrees to. So what, what ends up happening is you create this, a floor, basically you create like a, a set of minimums, which are like we, people with widely differing interests and belief systems and worldviews and everything else. There are certain things that we all agree to that should be rules for our society. Let's find them, acknowledge them, encode them into our society, and then keep going until we can't, until we can't find any more rules that we all agree to. So contractualism is sort of setting this minimum standard where we're all buying into the system because we all know that if we don't buy into the system, if we don't, if we can't justify our rules to you, then you won't, you'll veto them. And if you can't justify your rules to me, then I'll veto them. So we all approach this from a position of like, let's be reasonable and try to find what unites us instead of what divides us. So I'd talk about that theory, which I really like, which I think is very interesting. And then Ubuntu would be a sort of like, let's take that theory and just kind of supercharge it and pump it up and inflate it a little more and say that when we're not just acting out of this sense of community, like contractualism relies on the other people in the community, because if you don't rely on them and their reasonableness, then you're not going to get any of your rules passed, right? So it's a cooperative venture that you're engaging in. Ubuntu takes that idea and just kind of like lifts it up and elevates it to the highest heights of the community, which is to say, nobody does anything. Nobody makes a move here unless we are sure that all of the other people with whom we're engaged in this cooperative venture are happy and flourishing and safe and have food to eat and water to drink. So it's very interesting to take a extremely contemporary, like late 90s American uh, you know, Kantian based rules uh, philosophy and find the parallels in it in this never really encoded or written down Southern African philosophy that has existed for centuries in all of these nations and say like, wow, we're all, we're all getting at the same thing here, right? We're all aiming at the same idea. We're all climbing the same mountain. We're just climbing it from different cliff faces. And I think that's fascinating. I do too. I, it, I mean, my, mom and dad are, are like that. And it, it's always struck me uh, that notion of when somebody comes over, no matter who it is, you know, in our house, it's uh, to make sure, making sure everybody has a beer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, but, you know, or, or w whether it's water or food or comfort, you know, the creature comforts. And, and at some point it 
can't help but occur to you that, well, uh, how far how far do you spread out that circle of neighborliness? You know, I, right. I would do that for anybody in my town, county, state, you know, and eventually, <laughs> if you know, if, if you're good with math, you realize, oh, that ev everyone is actually our neighbor on the planet and mm -hmm. everyone deserves a drink of water, turns out. Yeah, exactly. And the, and as soon as that idea takes hold of you, it's very hard to get rid of it. It's very hard to, you, you realize pretty quickly, like there's no line to draw here. Like if, you're, if your instinct or your mission is to extend general courtesy and comfort to the people around you, then it then it extends all the way around the globe and back from the other side and you don't um you there's no reason to ever draw a line and, and exclude anyone from it and suddenly we're all holding hands and singing songs and being happy that's right it's that easy <laughs> uh let's let's get, let's take things back towards the contentious um right you something i i really admire about you and it and it reminds me of of great writers that I uh, look up to like Wendell Berry, you're unsurprisingly one of the most conscientious and PG rated writers I've ever met, especially <laughs> for like a, uh, you know, a very successful comedy writer. You and a lot of your characters often refer to like the most vile of villains, the like the filthiest bad <laughs> men and women are jerks and turkeys mm -hmm. uh, he's a total turkey um mm -hmm. which which that's that's the part of uh, uh Le leslie nope that i attribute to to your voice uh and you go on like you'll excoriate their crimes by saying like their behavior really stinks um and i and i love it because you even even on social media even on twitter you like are really uh well mannered you you know you don't don't resort to profanity much um so you can imagine my absolute delight when on page 248 of the hardcover of your book you rightly call representative ted yoho's attempt at an apology for calling his colleague alexandria ocasio cortez an effing bitch um you call it <laughs> and i i was so delighted uh, yeah by that but um i'm i'm curious what you're planning to do when uh when that gets out and you get joe rogan uh, <laughs> <laughs> um well to be fair um i i didn't call it well i did call it, um i did call it but i i didn't the reason that i called it specifically is because of a book called on by a philosopher named harry frankfurt who um <clears throat> taught at princeton and oxford and um and was an incredibly brilliant person and who also wrote an entire book called on where he basically tried to pin down what he saw as a specific kind of rhetoric that exists in the modern era. And he, he wanted to um, distinguish from lying. Um, and what he says essentially is that lying is a situation in which you know what the truth is and you kind of sneak in and you remove the truth and you replace it intentionally with a piece of misinformation. That's what a lie is. And, what he said was the is is a situation in which the speaker is utterly unconcerned what the truth is it doesn't matter what matters to the speaker is that the words that he or she is saying make the listener feel a certain way about him so it's immaterial whether he believes it or doesn't believe it whether it's true or false it doesn't matter what he's doing is disregarding the truth in and searching for a reaction from his listeners that will help him in some way so the example that one example that he gives is a is a politician of either party doesn't matter on july 4th giving a a rousing rah rah america is great and bald eagles and the flag and the constitution and the founding fathers and 
1776 in Concord and Lexington, et cetera, et cetera. It, it might be the case that this speaker really um, cares deeply about the founding of the country. It might be that the speaker couldn't care less. It doesn't matter what he is doing. Let's say it's a he in that moment is, is he knows like it is good for politicians to appear in a certain way. This is an event celebrating the birth of our nation. I am going to spew forth a bunch of BS that I, that it doesn't really matter whether I care about it or not, because I need the people listening to me to think of me in, as a certain kind of person. So very often, and that section of the book is about apologies, um, <clears throat> and apologies are things that I, human beings, I think, are uniquely terrible at. And I will not exempt myself from this. I am a, I'm not a good apologizer by any stretch. Uh, you also are volunteering that about yourself. It is a very difficult thing to apologize well when you screw up. And because we all screw up, this is a this is our cross to bear, really, um, is that we we hate apologizing. It's embarrassing. We don't want to do it. It feels icky. It's a thing that you put off as long as you possibly can. And then when you do it, there are better and worse ways to do it. And in that case, uh, Congressman Yoho, who screamed an obscenity at his colleague, his actual apology is the most bananas thing I've ever heard in my life. It is truly, it's worth reading, looking up on the internet. Actually, you can watch him get deliver his apology um, because he starts off by saying that he that he is sorry uh, for the the, na the nature of the tone or something with which he spoke to his colleague. Then he immediately kind of denies that he said anything wrong and he's sorry if she misconstrued it in a certain way, which is, I'm not sure how anyone can misconstrue that phrase and effing yeah. be. Uh, and then he starts talking about how when he was a kid, he was poor and he was on food stamps and his wife and he were were poor. And it's like, what are we doing, man? Like, we're not even on the track anymore. Like, we, we've completely derailed here. And the, the problem with it, of course, is that when you do apologize to someone, the whole point of it is to admit fault and ask for forgiveness. And if you're off on some crazy tangent where you're not, you're saying like, I'm sorry that I said it, but actually I didn't say it. And if you think I said it, you're an idiot. And also I have problems too. And also look over there. And also, what about this problem and whatever? I mean, it's a it's a version of what I was doing when I asked that guy to care more about Hurricane Katrina than his car, right? It's like, how, it's like, yes, I bumped into you, but what about this much larger problem that we should all care about much more? Like, you can't, we can't live in a world where that's okay to do because if we lived in that world no dispute over anything big or small could ever be solved because we would all just look around, find whatever thing is happening in the world that's more important than whatever you and I are arguing over, drag it into the equation, point at it, and then get off scot-free. Like that's not a viable universe, right? So that apologizing isn't technically really ethics. It's more, I, I think of it as like an exit interview when you've blown something. Like it's I made a mistake. Now I'm going to go through this ritual, which is intended to heal the wound and also to kind of like put a period at the end of this sentence and and wrap it up into a little package that I can then take with me and look at later and try to understand why I did what I did, why it made me feel this way, why it made you feel this way. And so if you're not even doing it right, then there's no point in doing it. Like it, he would have been much better off if he just said like, I'll never apologize for that. I was right. At least then he would be like, okay, guy's a jerk, but like, he's not, he's not pretending that he's anything else. Like I, that would be a weirdly a more noble act to me than saying you're going to apologize. And then the opposite of apologizing in public. Yeah. He, he would have saved us all uh, a lot of. <laughs> um, one, one other question I had was, uh, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating thing. You know, you and I have had the pleasure of working together a lot. And um, it's, you know, uh, you're, it, for me, you're one of the writers that I came to. Uh, Wendell Berry was the first that sort of awoke my, I don't know, sense of civic duty, as it were, or just my sense of what we're, we're talking about, where I, I, I guess I grew up, uh, it was in my late 20s. And I, and I came to understand that I needed to care about uh, more than, you know, feeding myself and, and, and 
getting kissed. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's never, and it's, that's never stopped growing, you know, the, the more we have this awareness, um, and, and, but it was wonderful to discover, uh, mostly with your help that, uh, we are in a business of storytelling. And so we can work that kind of messaging into, you know, what we do, what we create as artists. And, and for me, that's always my palliative when I get all heated up, when I'm angry about something that's going on in, in politics or in the world. And I get frustrated I, and say, what, how, how can we do anything about this? I say, well, I, I have this job where I can encourage everyone to carry a handkerchief uh, or say please and thank you or, you know, what, what have you. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the artists or, or you know, the, the moments of culture that have taught me that. But there, uh, also in the book, you mention how you're, you're listing a, a list uh, of all the ways you got lucky, you know, that yeah. led you to the place where you are. And one of the first ones is uh, you were homesick from school and your mom uh, let you watch the movie Sleeper. And that's something that uh, that I like hearing you talk about is if uh, if there are, are people whose work we admire and enjoy, but then uh, they turn out to be bad in some way or have something questionable about their characters, mm -hmm. are we still allowed to enjoy their movies or, or music or books or what have you? Yeah, this is the, this was the hardest chapter to write in the book. Um, for for a number of reasons, starting with the fact that I I think it is the question that mo the most people are wrestling with on a day to day basis. I mean, maybe the question that we're wrestling with, ethically speaking, the most is something involving wearing masks or vaccines or something like that. But in general, if you broaden out, the question of whether you can separate the art from the artist is something that we have all faced because we now know so much more than we used to about the lives and behaviors of so many people, famous and not famous. And not only do we know about the people, we know about companies and we know about institutions and sports teams and athletes and everything else. So at some point in the last 20 years, unless you are a, a hermit, essentially, you have had to ask yourself the question, Oh boy, can I still watch that movie? Can I still listen to this music? Am I allowed to, what am I allowed to listen to? What is it okay to listen to? Is it okay to listen to Michael Jackson songs or Eric Clapton's music? Is it okay to look at Picasso's paintings or watch Miramax movies that I used to love? Like there is no escaping this question. And so in my case, my sense of humor was uh, essentially started by Woody Allen, like really like Sleeper, Take the Money and Run, Bananas, Annie Hall, Manhattan. These movies were foundational to, to who I was. It wasn't just like, oh, I like that guy. It was like, this is, this created something in me, this set wheels in motion that are still in motion today. And then you learn when you're older about certain things that Woody Allen has done and has been alleged to do. And you can't help but wonder if you're me, what does this mean in terms of how okay it is to continue to support him? And I think there's no easy answer to this. Um, I write about it at length in the book, if you're interested in the entire answer, but I, I essentially land here. Um, I land in a place with this where I say, there is for each of us a line that we will have to draw and the on, on one side of the line are people who have done things who have whose behavior has been exposed that is in our minds almost irredeemable and to which we can no longer possibly imagine having that person be a part of our lives it just it's too like there's no version of a redemption story for harvey weinstein it doesn't exist like the amount of pain and suffering and misery and awfulness that he caused is too great. And, and so you meh, over there. Now, on the other side of the line are people who either have done things that aren't as bad in our opinion, 
or we're bad, but the person has then done some work on him or herself and has changed his or her behavior, apologized in a way that maybe was sincere and not BS. Um, or just, or is so foundational to who we are that you can't imagine taking a scalpel and just cutting that person out of your soul because you're a musician and Eric Clapton's music was just too important to you, or you're an actor and whoever Mel Gibson's acting is too important to you or whatever. And I think that the only mistake that you can make, well, there's two. One is you can never draw that line. The other thing you can do in theory is say, everyone who's ever done anything is in, right? Like I, I'm not going to care at all about any of this stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to just say that it doesn't matter what you've done. I'm going to, there's no point. It's too hard to discern these lines. And so I'm just going to support everybody. And if you do that, you're essentially saying, I have no compassion or empathy for any of the people who have been hurt in the world by any of these people and their pain is meaningless to me. And I don't think that's a good idea either. So essentially we have to draw that line in the somewhere. We have to draw a line and we have to say, I'm going to continue to support these people and not these people. As soon as we draw that line, someone will point out the inconsistency in our world. Someone will say, I can't believe you support that person and not this person. Or how can you possibly not support this person when you're supporting that person or whatever. And when that happens, if there's new information, we might need to erase that line and draw it again somewhere else. And that's okay, because this is a muddy gray issue that we can't possibly, there's no one rule that we can run. There's no system we can run all the people through and get an answer from a computer that says, yes, this person is okay to support and this person isn't. I think I froze somewhere in the middle, didn't I? Did I freeze for like eight seconds? Just, yeah, just briefly. <laughs> okay, good. I hope I... Well, what the the things I was saying in those eight seconds were incredible. They were so smart and brilliant. Yeah, I'm sorry that you missed them. Um, well, thank you, thank you for uh, for that. I mean, you know, the, as a civilization of human beings, it's important to understand that it it is a project that will f uh, require maintenance in perpetuity. It will mm -hmm. never be done with this cake uh it will always require improvement indeed um, and as soon as we think it's done jim o'hare will sit on it <laughs> uh listen we we uh are having a, a very great talk but i want to i want to get to some audience questions great um, before uh before i get chased out of the commonwealth club um are you in the Commonwealth Club right now? Is that where you're zooming from? I assume so. I, I the, I'm in the cockpit of my uh, Tesla truck, <laughs> uh, my stainless steel wedge. Is that what it looks like inside? I didn't know that. Pretty freaky, yeah. Um, oh, man, I had my I had my helmet, um, but um, yeah. So I think I think I'm parked in the garage at the Commonwealth Club. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't. I, I, I've, I'm being sent the audience questions, but I don't have a name. So uh, audience member one asks, <laughs> is there a certain guide that you follow to help create these amazing shows since you and your shows are so witty? <clears throat> well, um, n no, uh, I'm not quite sure what audience member one means by guide. I, 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 I would say that the guide that I've had is Greg Daniels, who adapted the British office into the American version and who is my sort of writing mentor and guru. I would also say that I've had a number of other guides in my life, people like um, Adam McKay and Tina Fey, who were the head writers at SNL when I was there, um, <clears throat> and and many, many other uh, people, Lauren Michaels and and Mike Shoemaker and all these people who sort of at key moments in my career were in positions of authority and shared their wisdom with me. Um, and and then, you know, every TV show is a massive collaborative project that everyone is uh, working on at the same time. I would like to think is 
corny as it might sound that the that the shows themselves are sort of guides that they take on lives of their own and and vibes of their own and that when you were working on Parks and Rec that you and Amy and and Aubrey and Adam Scott and and Chris Pratt and the entire cast and Rashida like that that the cast became a sort of guide because you sort of start to feel like I need to write stories and dialogue that follows the strengths and and what's interesting about these people to the best of my ability and so you can kind of use the actors and the and the other writers on the show as guides if that makes sense um so there's no one person greg is probably the closest i have to a to a true sherpa in terms of learning how to do this job i i agree and that, that's very generous of you to include uh, some of us actors in that list. Uh, we're, we're more like Tupperwares. We're, uh, we hold, we gently hold your, uh, your ideas. Speaking relative to uh, SNL writing, this is uh, audience member number two. Mm. Relative to SNL and The Office, Parks and Rec, Good Place, was writing a book a uniquely different experience as a writer Harder, easier, weirder. Uh, audience member two, I would say, was uh, ten times as hard uh, than the writing a TV show. Um, for the simple reason that when you write a TV show, there's a lot of other people who are sitting around near you who are helping you. Um, in fact, it's not even fair to say they're helping you. You're all just doing it together. So, you know, if you're writing a TV show and you're working on a script and you write a joke that sucks you turn to your left and you say, can anyone beat this joke? And then one of the 10 people in the room will have a better joke. And then you put that joke in and then the show gets better. When you're writing a book, you write a joke that sucks and you turn to your left and what you see is your own bookshelf <laughs> and there's no one there and it's very scary and you feel very alone. In fact, there were a couple of times where I knew that the joke I had written in the book sucked and I emailed the writing staff of The Good Place and was like, hey, I wrote this joke in a book in this book and it sucks can someone pitch a better joke and instantly in 30 seconds like everyone jen stasky and joe mandy and and megan amram and and aisha muhar like everybody wrote back five jokes that were better than the one that i had written and i thought god this would have been so much easier if i had just gotten them all <laughs> to group write this <laughs> so yes it was much harder i i really enjoyed it it was a it was a fun kind of harder but it was definitely much harder that, that is a great tip to aspiring writers. If, if you run into a tough spot, uh, just get a hold of your hit sitcom writing <laughs> room. It's a great life hack, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, audience member number three is asking, what is the story behind uh, your Twitter handle, which is Ken Tremendous? Correct, My, at Ken Tremendous. So um, <clears throat> when I... I was 19 or 20 I was walking down the street I was in college and I was taking a fiction writing class and I suddenly thought that it would be funny to name a character in a story Ken Tremendous I don't know why I don't know where it came from but I got home and uh this is an actual life hack if you're a writer when you have dumb ideas like that write them down on a piece of paper you will not remember them they will disappear from your brain instantly and you have to write them down so I wrote down Ken Tremendous on a piece of paper and I always thought like, I don't know what that is. It's just a name that's ridiculous. And then um, I started a blog with my friends, Alan Yang and Dave King and Matt Murray called Fire Joe Morgan, which was about sports writing, bad sports writing and making fun of it. And we, without thinking for more than eight seconds, chose handles on this blogger site. And I chose Ken Tremendous. And then it just became my internet name. Like it just, that was like when I started a Twitter handle, I chose Ken Tremendous when I, when I, um, any, any time I like am on the internet, that is my name. It's my name on Reddit and a bunch of other places. So I, it's a completely meaningless, silly story of just a name popped into my head that I thought was funny. I will say that I have a, as you know, Nick, nothing, propensity. nothing brings me more joy than silly names, nothing in the world. This is the Monty Python influence in me in my childhood, nothing in the world makes me happier. And if you want to see some of my best work, some of the best writing I've ever done 
far better and more important, I would say, than anything in this book, go to the IMDb page for Parks and Recreation, scroll towards the bottom and look at all of the names of all of the characters who were in one episode. <laughs> And you will find some of my, what I consider to be my greatest work. Yeah, w welcome to the Lurpus family. <laughs> um, I love it. I, I had one of those, uh, I did the same thing, C came up with a, a stupid name that I'm very, still very proud of, uh, Goliath Johnson. <laughs> uh, I should have used that for Twitter. Uh, yeah. Now, we uh, we have a question from David. Hmm. Are you still the commissioner of your son's little league? Any new interesting moral questions in the league? <clears throat> I am no longer the commissioner of my son's little league. I technically was never the entire league commissioner. I was the 11U or 10U commissioner, and then I think 11U commissioner. And then when I was 12, you, I, I was on the board of the organization, but I was no longer the league commissioner or the, the grade level or the age level commissioner. Um, if you ever are interested in, in ethical dilemmas and, and, um, and, and the, the joys of just human negotiation, getting involved in youth sports is a great laboratory because it's a, it's a pretty silly thing that is intended for the enjoyment and general development of young men and women and uh people treat it like it is the like it's the yalta conference <laughs> it is really it is really funny how the 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 levels of uh intensity and how they range in the people involved from from like hey we're all just in a neighborhood baseball league let's just enjoy and have fun all the way to like this is the end of times and we need to um act in, a, in the most uh, intense way possible. So I, I was very fun and I believe wholeheartedly in youth sports. I believe wholeheartedly in neighborhood leagues. This was not a, a travel league. This was just a neighborhood park rec league. And it does a lot of great work and has hundreds and hundreds of kids who participate. I'm very happy to have done it. Uh, I'm also happy that I'm no longer doing it. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Uh Anna asks, we have a couple of sticky ones now. Mm. What, what is your viewpoint on the idea that nothing you do can ever be truly 100% ethical? I know this was touched on in a good place, mm. but curious to know your personal thoughts. I, of course, do believe that um, in the world in which we live, from the moment you open your eyes in the morning, you're, you're ethically compromised. There's no way around it. You're, you're burning fuel that's polluting the air and you're, you own objects that were made in places using forced labor that wasn't paid properly. And you're, you're engaging in various activities just by existing that, um, that are, that mean you're ethically compromised. It's just the nature of the beast. There's only one person in the world who even attempted to avoid this. And it's, it's this guy, it's Doug Forsett from the good place who decided to essentially remove himself from society, only grow beans that require very little water, uh, recycle his water and drink his own urine. Uh, so as not to disrupt the, uh, ecosystem of his, where he lived. And that is not a life that anyone can lead. In fact, it's not a life anyone should attempt to lead. The goal here is not to get a hundred on this test. Um, that is impossible. It's not even a good goal, really. There's a, a woman named Susan Wolf, a professor who I talk about in the book, who wrote a wonderful paper called Moral Saints, where she essentially proves in an incredibly elegant way that attempting moral sainthood or perfection, if you will, is not only impossible, it's a bad goal. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a bad idea to even attempt it or consider it for various reasons that I will let you read about. <clears throat> but um, that's okay. Like, no, like you don't have to be a hundred percent ethical. No one, no one can be a hundred percent ethical and you don't, you shouldn't try. What you should try to be is a slightly more ethical person than the one you were yesterday. Um, and then the next day you should try that again and you'll fail like uh, from time to time, like the world is too complicated and tricky 
and the number of decisions you have to make are too great and varied and impossible to parse and figure out for you ever to have steady incremental uh, increase in, in your ethical value every day of your life. Like you're going to take steps backwards without even knowing it. That's okay. Like I, there's, there's a woman um, who teaches at UCLA who um, came to the conclusion that the number of ethical choices we face and moral choices we face in life are so enormous and cause us so much pain and, and agony. And also she realized no one asked to be born right? We didn't have a choice in the matter. So she concludes that having children is unethical because you're bringing someone into the world against their will. And you're then setting them on a course that requires them to make all of these horrifying ethical choices and moral choices that will cause them pain and agony and suffering. So we should stop having kids and die out that that's the only actual moral path that humanity can face. So if you take any of this stuff to the to its logical conclusions and to the far ends of the bell curve, you will find some disturbing conclusions, right? Like, um, and and that is certainly true of any attempt at perfection. Like, I I really I really one of the most comforting things I have learned is that it's impossible. You shouldn't try. You'll never get there, and that's okay. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're about as close as it comes. Like I would say you're you're at like a ninety eight point four right now. There's some of that comedy that you're known for. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I appreciate your uh, your optimism. Um, we're uh, we're getting close. We got time for maybe one or two more questions. Here's one from Elaine. Do you have any tips? for how to maintain both integrity and in quotes goodness in the craziness that is hollywood um i get this a version of this question a lot um and i it, for obvious reasons hollywood is you know the reputation of hollywood is um is that it's like a a den of sin and and horrifying behavior that reputation in some cases is well earned obviously Hollywood is a lot better now than it was even 10 years ago, I would say. The way that people are treated uh, is significantly different as a whole. That doesn't mean it's great or it's, it's far from perfect, but I also believe that Hollywood's reputation, while sometimes being well-earned, is a little unfair because the people in Hollywood are famous. The people who work in in uh, consulting firms and accounting firms are not famous. And so their awful behavior isn't as interesting to the general public. And when someone is revealed to be a monster and that person works for McKinsey Consulting, uh, well, all right, it's his name is Jim Johnson and he works at McKinsey Consulting and he's a monster. But if Harvey Weinstein or Les Moonves or whoever is revealed to be a monster, it's like, ooh, that's interesting, right? So I actually don't think, and maybe this is naive, but I don't think it's that much harder to maintain a sense of integrity or goodness in Hollywood than it is anywhere else. Um, there are different stresses on your life. There are different bad motivations that you can fall into. Those things are, you know, fame and power and money and success. Like those things are corrupting influences. There's no question. But I think also if you work at McKinsey Consulting, the things that could corrupt you are fame and well, not fame, but power and success and status and, and money. So I, I, I actually don't think it's that much worse. I, I, and the trickier thing about Hollywood and the way that I guess maybe it is harder is that the endeavors you're undertaking are creative in nature. And that requires a lot of banging your head against a wall and a lot of collaboration. And the, oftentimes the, hierarchical structures that are in place are not totally clear you know like if you work at if you work at a normal industry like there's an org chart that says this person is this person's boss and this person is this person's boss it frequently isn't that way in hollywood and so as a result you have this kind of weird nebulous it's unclear who reports to who and who it's kosher to to you know go out with on a date and who it isn't you know so there's there are certain like weirdnesses about hollywood that make it difficult but i think you just develop your own sense of integrity and what you think matters about the world and you try to stick to it and it doesn't it shouldn't matter that much where you are 
um, you should just do what you think is right to the best of your ability and let the chips fall where they may. Maybe that was an unsatisfying answer. I'm sorry if that was unsatisfying. I mean, I, I think people would generally be dissatisfied with the, you know, gen, as you say, the, the actual amount of iniquity that exists, uh, you know, uh, it's it's more banal it's not it's not like there's cocaine and prostitutes every place it's like there's uh you know there's like bad working conditions like long hours underpaid etc yeah um, but i uh am here to say that mike's shows are famous for being uh great places to work and we have a good friend named Morgan Sackett who produces these shows and he does a great job of making sure everybody's taken care of, not just the gorgeous people. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. One more question. Uh, I've got one from Connor. How do you approach the need for survival over goodness? loggers actively causing deforestation in the amazon having to choose work for basic needs over the greater good where's the line is there one this is an excellent question and what it's getting at is is context i think right it's easy in the abstract to say you should not cut down a tree um, it is harder to say to a person whose family is depending on the money that they get from working as a logger that they shouldn't cut down a tree because what's at stake for them is not the abstract preservation of the of the ecosystem or the environment, but literally, will I be able to make money today or earn uh, a living or feed my family? So context is is something that, a lot of philosophers ignore to their peril, I think. Um, <clears throat> the existentialists, for example, say like, your actions are your actions, and there are good and bad actions, and all you are is your actions. And, you know, I, the example I give in the book is Jean Valjean and Les Miserables stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. Um, well, when, so when he did that, you know, his family was starving, he felt like he had no choice. If I stole a loaf of bread from a store, I would just be a rich who stole a loaf of bread for no reason. And yet a lot of philosophers, including Jean-Paul Sartre and Immanuel Kant, would say there's some difference between those two actions. It was just an action that violated an ethical rule and we're both at fault. So they ignore very frequently the context under which these things are done. and. There are people in the world who can, to a greater or lesser degree, even care about ethics as a concept, right? Like you and I are sitting here having a pleasant chat from our homes in Los Angeles over expensive computer equipment, and we have the ability to spend an hour musing about the nature of ethical behavior. Well, that makes that means that you and I are two of the, I don't know, 100,000 thousand luckiest human beings alive on earth, something like that, right? Like there are no stresses on our lives that are caught that would cause us to not be able to do this right now. And I do think that we have to be incredibly vigilant about when we judge people or when we decide this is good, this is bad. The context matters enormously in these situations and the same act that is undertaken by two people on different sides of the globe, the same exact action might have incredibly different um, moral value to it. And the flip side of this coin, obviously, is that I believe that when you're talking about the people who are at the top of the power and status food chain in the world, I believe they're morally obligated to do a whole lot more than than someone who's not in that position. Like right now, there's a story that Jeff Bezos is, uh, he built a giant boat and the boat can't get to the ocean because there's an ancient bridge in Rotterdam that is that has to, that would, the boat would knock into. So Jeff Bezos is paying out of his own pocket to dismantle this old historically important bridge so that he can float his giant boat out a canal and get to the ocean. Jeff Bezos doesn't pay taxes in this country. Like he doesn't contribute anything. And yet he has no problem building a giant dumb boat that he doesn't need 
that probably cost 500, 800 million dollars, whatever. And then he has no problem reaching into his pocket and throwing whatever it is, a couple million bucks at the city of Rotterdam to dismantle a bridge and put it back together so we can get his big dumb boat into the ocean. That's, you know, there's a whole other discussion to be had about the ethics of capitalism and the and the and the tax code and everything else. But as a basic idea, I don't think it's controversial to say that if you have that ability to build a big dumb boat that costs a billion dollars and dismantle a bridge and then put it back together just so you can get your big dumb boat out in the ocean, the moral requirements of you have to be greater than they are the average human being on earth. And you more should be expected of you and you should be uh, intend, you should intend always to act with greater uh, alacrity when a disaster strikes or when a problem emerges. You should be thinking more than the average person is about how you can be a good person and how you can do good things because you have the ability to. And, and by ability, I don't mean like the intellectual ability. I mean, literally, you have a trillion dollars and you have no problems. There's, no, there's nothing in your life that is causing you any kind of stress or discomfort. And if that's the case, which is not the case for most of the people on the planet, then you owe it to the rest of us to think really hard all the time about how you might do more good than you're doing now. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, at least pay some taxes. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, let's start with the bare minimum. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh contribute, chip in. Chip in for roads and highways and bridges and schools mm -hmm. and garbage collection and stuff. I mean, come on, man. Like, come on. What are we doing? <laughs> uh, well, I hope, you know, I hope that this book is incredibly successful because it's medicinal. It's good for us all. It's, uh, it's wonderful to, to receive, um, you know, it's the, it's the kind of book that if, if every class in, in our education system was in this casual, friendly, and humorous voice, uh, people would learn a lot more. You know, it, it takes, um, I, could, I could never read uh, Camus. I, I could never st stomach that guy, um, but you really humanized him for me. I'm glad. I'm and glad. turned me on to uh, how hunky he was. Oh my God. Such a such a stud that guy. Woo! Easy on the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, some say Camus. I know. I uh, I want to thank you, Mike, for uh, letting me do this with you. I'm always happy to see you, um, Mike. If you if you just got here, you have terrible timing. Uh, we've been <laughs> speaking with Mike Sure, the author of How to Be Perfect: The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question. That's right. I encourage you to pick up your copy of Mike's book at your local independent bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I am Nick Offerman. Please stay happy and healthy and mind your manners, please and thank you. Thank you, buddy.